Lent, namely a penitential period, a time when people come to grips with their limitations, their sins, their attachments, to prepare for real communion with God. Welcome back to the Word on Fire show. I'm Brandon Vaught, the host, and I'm joined here in our new setup for the Word on Fire show by Bishop Robert Barron. Bishop Barron, good to see you. Hey, Brandon, good to see you. Good to hear from you. We talked about this in the last episode, but we've revamped the setups, not only of your YouTube commentaries, but also this Word on Fire show. We're still in the same studio space, which is a really, really small room there at the Mission in Santa Barbara, but we've been able to turn it into multiple sets now, and we're all just so enthusiastic about the way it looks now. What do you think? Yeah, thanks to our donors. It's uh, it's wonderful, you know, and we got to just keep going and doing the Lord's work, and um, it's expensive, as I say, and so we're grateful to those who've uh, helped us with this. Bishop, you recently uh, visited the uh, Carmelite Sisters of Alhambra out there in your region. Tell us what that visit was like. Uh, they're a marvelous community, about 140 sisters, I think. Uh, they were founded way back in the um, in Mexico, actually, during the, uh, the Cristero period. And their, their foundress, the wonderful uh, Madre Luisita, came up here to the States to, to flee the persecution back in the 20s, and then established the community in uh, LA. And I was at one of the sites now of their, of their uh, order. They take care of, of the poor and the sick and the, and the aged. And they're just a marvelous, um, up, uplifting, life-giving uh, community to be with. Um, so there was a joy. I, I celebrated the Mass for the uh, birthday of the Foundress. And then there was a wonderful show they put on for me afterwards in the Carmelite tradition. That goes back to the Little Flower. Remember, she talks about they would put on these plays and so on. Well, they still do that. And uh, they were they were kind of teasing me by making um, uh, Madre Luisita one of the pivotal players. And so they used some of the film from our uh, work. So they were just a delight. We'll have to film an episode 13 of Pivotal Players yeah. to feature her in there, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, we're recording this just a, a couple of days before Lent begins. Ash Wednesday is on February 26th this year. And so I thought we'd spend this whole episode discussing Lent, what it means, how we do it, um, what it's looked like throughout the ages. Uh, So first of all, I guess a basic question, what's the purpose of Lent, these 40 days before Easter? Why does the church give that to us? What's it supposed to be about? To prepare us for Easter. You know, Brandon, it goes way back uh, in really all the great religious traditions. You find something like Lent, namely a penitential period, a time when people come to grips with their limitations, their sins, their attachments, to prepare for real communion with God. And that's the purpose of Lent, is to get us ready for Easter. You know, part of it is, we can just become blasé, I suppose, about an event like the resurrection of Jesus. We've, we've known about it, we've, we've heard about it, we celebrate it every year, but are we ready for it? That's what Lent is. Um, So it corresponds, of course, to Jesus' own 40 days in the desert, preparing for his public ministry. Um, I think for all of us, it's just indispensable that on a regular basis, we go into the desert. A lot of important things happen in the desert, and that's the, the purpose of Lent. I know for a lot of Catholics, maybe the majority of Catholics in the pew, when we hear Lent, we just think, okay, giving up chocolate. Like, that's what basically Lent means, you know? And there's nothing, I don't want to uh, bemoan that and say that that's bad. It's, it's good to give up something uh, that you're maybe attached to, but is Lent more than that? <laughs> what, what more is Lent than just giving up sweets for 40 days? Yeah, and that can be one expression of it. Uh, classically, Lent uh, involves three practices. Prayer, fasting, and that's where even something like that comes in. And thirdly, almsgiving. So those are the three classical practices. Something, Brandon, I'd like to emphasize is Lent is not so much in here. It's a set of things that we do. Pray during Lent. Fast during Lent. Give alms during Lent. Three activities, three things that we do. That, I think, helps to um, orient us to this holy season. Let's talk about each of those three pillars. Maybe we'll spend a good amount of time on each one. So first of all, prayer. Prayer. I think this is the one most obviously people associate with Lent. It tends to be a time when the church in the liturgy and through devotions deepens its intensity of prayer. How do we do this? What do you recommend to to Catholics to deepen their prayer during Lent? 
First of all, prayer is the raising of the mind and the heart to God, the famous definition from John Damascene. I love that, to raise the mind and the heart to God. It means to attend to God, to be aware of God, to seek communion with God in a conscious way. Raising up of the mind, yes, with all of our consciousness and attentiveness, our perception, our intellectual um, ability, but also to raise up the heart to God. So our passions and our feelings and our emotions and the longings of our soul, to do that in a very explicit, conscious way is to pray. So I think, you know, I, I, this morning I begin every day with a holy hour. And I go into my chapel and I, I genuflect before the Blessed Sacrament. And then I just enter into this hour of prayer. It involves the office and other things, the rosary and so on. But the basic move is I'm consciously raising my mind and heart to God. It's so easy for us just to lose track of that. So that's what the essence of prayer is. Now, how do you do it? All kinds of uh, practices we could recommend. What's the greatest prayer? The Mass. I'd say to Catholics, maybe who've drifted away, if you stop going to Mass on Sunday, Lent is a great time now to say, I am going to go back to Sunday Mass. Do you go to Mass on Sunday? Okay, how about daily Mass during Lent? Or even, I'm going to go you know, twice during the week during Lent. That whatever you're doing in regard to the Mass, raise it a level, intensify it. Maybe enter more deeply into the Mass. Get a a study guide or a book or a a video or something on the Mass so you can more deeply appreciate it. I mentioned the Rosary. It's a very important prayer. Um, If you've been away from the Rosary for a long time, well, find it. It's probably in a drawer somewhere in your house or it's gathering dust somewhere. Find it. Use it. Pray it. If it's difficult for you, maybe try once a week. Each week during Lent, you're going to pray the rosary. Try it twice a week. I'd recommend uh, pray it every day if you can. Um, The Jesus prayer is one that I've always recommended. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, have mercy on me, a sinner. That's the whole Jesus prayer. But you can pray it over and again for a minute, for five minutes, for ten minutes, for an hour. Let it become part of of the rhythm of your breathing. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Try that prayer during Lent. Devotions, the the Stations of the Cross, to go to your local church and to do that prayerful meditation on the the death of Jesus. Um, Enter into these devotions maybe you haven't practiced since you were a kid. And you say, oh, it's been so long. Well, okay, Lent's a good time. To, to enter into those again. So those are all ways, you know, Brandon, that we can pray. Uh, I mentioned the holy hour. Now, maybe that's, that's relatively advanced, I guess, but, you know, Fulton Sheen, one of our great heroes, recommended it to every priest when he gave a retreat, to lay people when he gave them a retreat. His practical advice was, every day, spend an hour before the Blessed Sacrament. Maybe you're getting started, it's a holy 15 minutes, it's a holy half hour. Okay, start with the head if you want. But spend time in um, adoration. May I say, I, I might have mentioned this now in an earlier show, Brandon, that when I met with the uh, Pope for the Ad Limina visit, when the bishops of, of my region met with him, one of the first things he said to us was, teach your people adoration. Teach your people adoration of the Blessed Sacrament. And um, that stayed in my mind. So another prayerful practice you could uh, exercise during Lent. All those are are ways. Is there an especially Lenten character of prayer uh, that maybe is distinct from other liturgical seasons? I'm thinking like of the season of Advent, which takes the form of expectation and longing. You know, how long, O Lord, how long? Or, O come, O come, O Israel. How about Lent? Is there a specific character of Lenten prayer? Well, it's probably penitential in form, you know, getting in touch with my own weakness, um, asking the Lord for forgiveness, asking for help in your struggle against, you know, your own vices and your own attachments, your own sin. Um, You know, Brandon, it's, it's not a morbid thing at all. Getting in touch with your sinfulness is a great form of prayer. If I, before the Lord, confess 
So I, there's the formal sacrament of, of reconciliation, but just the, the confession of sin in the presence of the Lord, that's a good prayerful practice. And it's not, it's not it shouldn't depress you. It's, it's in front of the Lord who loves you more than you love yourself. And to say, help me deal with, Lord, this issue. You know, in Ignatius of Loyola, you've got the consciousness examine at the end of the day. It's when you kind of review your day in light of God. Um, all the great things happened to you, the opportunities, the graces, but also all the things that blocked you. you know, today I had the opportunity, Lord, to do this work of charity, but I didn't do it. Uh, today, Lord, I allowed that person just to bug me, and I, I didn't reach out in forgiveness and love. I, I had this chance, which I, you know, missed. Good, good. Don't don't feel you know that you're falling into the the slough of despond. I mean, you're you're confessing in the presence of the Lord. Those are all forms of Lenten prayer, it seems to me. So that's the first major pillar of Lent prayer. Let's look at the second pillar, which is fasting. Now, Bishop, you know, fasting has become all the rage in the world in general, in our general culture, you know, you talk about intermittent fasting, people fasting for various health benefits, uh, bodybuilding benefits, but from a religious perspective, from a spiritual perspective, why do we fast? What are the spiritual benefits of fasting? Well, attachment detachment, right, is a great spiritual category. We tend to get attached to uh, created things and we make them godlike in our lives. They take on an exaggerated importance. When that happens, it's good sometimes to actively detach oneself from them so as to find what the soul really wants. See, the soul can be so caught up in, in uh, secondary goods that it even begins to forget what it really wants. So if you're so sated all the time by, by seeking out a sensual pleasure, you can forget, boy, that your soul wants something much more than that. We're longing ultimately for God. Only in God is the soul at rest. So we all know that. Every sinner knows it, but I think our culture especially. That kind of awful, sickly feeling when you're sated by a lot of uh, sensual pleasures, food or drink or sex, as Aquinas put it, but your soul is left arid. Your soul is left unsatisfied. Well, one of the practices is to fast, purposely to set aside some of these uh, sensual pleasures, so as to allow the deeper hungers to emerge. Please, it has nothing to do with Puritanism or Platonism or dualism. It doesn't mean that we, we hate pleasure. You know, that's a caricature. I, I mean, maybe some Christian expressions have, have uh, fallen into that. But that's a, that's a caricature. Christians love the world because God made it good. We love food and drink and, and sensual pleasure. But they can become so dominant that we forget the deepest longing of the heart. And so we fast so as to allow that hunger to emerge. Something I've always loved from uh, Thomas Merton where he said, the, the sensual desires can be like little kids. I, I want it, I want it, I want it. A little kid that wants something right now. And even though you know, look, that's not good for you. You know, we're going to eat in an hour and you don't need an ice cream cone right now. But I want it, I want it, I want it. And if we allow our, our sensual desires to dominate us, it's like that. We start doing things that aren't good for us. So fasting is a wonderful way to rediscover the deepest longing of the heart. Um, it, it's not a, a Platonism or a Puritanism. It's a spiritual cleansing, if you want, to allow the, the deepest hunger to, uh, to express itself. Bishop, the minimum that the church asks of Catholics during Lent in terms of fasting is to abstain from meat on all Fridays and then on Ash Wednesday and Good Friday to fast. And at least in America, the way fasting is defined is one small meal with maybe a couple of snacks. Um, you've worked with a lot of people in spiritual direction elsewhere. Is that minimum usually what you recommend to most people? Do you recommend they fast more than that? And how do you make that determination? Yeah, I've always said to people, look, at the very least, uh, do what the church asks. It's not that demanding. And I'll say this too, Brandon. Uh, you know, I've, many years now of living through Lent, very often it's precisely the Friday abstinence 
that stays most in my mind or kind of bugs me the most or you know what I mean that I, I'm most aware that it's Lent because you know and I think you and I have this in common I don't like fish and so for me it's a real I, I don't want to exaggerate <laughs> like it's a terrible summary but it, it does get my attention let's put it that way Friday and Lent because I can't have meat and I can't have fish and so it's like oh what am I gonna do well that's all good see that's good because it it brings it into my body the fact of Lent. It brings it in, into my practical planning that I'm aware of Lent. So at the very least, yeah, follow what the church recommends. There's some people, you know, I know there are fish lovers that, oh, I love fish, so they have an extra helping, you know, on Friday. It's kind of defeating the purpose, you know. Uh, I've often encouraged people, is there a form of, of sensual pleasure that's too dominant in your life? Name that and then try to get some control over it. Uh, so the church's recommendations about fasting, but maybe that you could push it a little bit further. Uh, maybe it is skipping a meal, uh, you know, once a week. Um, I know some people who do really, really serious fasting, like like bread and water fasting on a Friday during Lent. Okay, as you say, we're doing it now for for bodybuilding purposes and and health purposes. So you know, why not for spiritual purpose too? There's something mysterious too, Brandon, isn't there? It goes right back to the Bible itself, and it comes up through the tradition that something about fasting accomplishes certain spiritual ends. And I can't explain that exactly. You know, but Jesus' famous line about, well, yeah, this, this type of demon only comes out through prayer and fasting. And I've talked to a number of uh, really spiritually alert people that I've known, and they'll say that. They'll say, oh yeah, fasting. If you want to accomplish that, you, you've got to fast. Now, why that works, <laughs> I don't entirely know. But uh, there's a lot of spiritual power to it. Now, as you say, how about something like, um, for a lot of us today, I'll include myself, you know, addiction to a video, not video games, but like the video, you know, the iPhone and the video stuff and screens. How about a little fasting from screens? Now, I realize the irony I'm saying this as I'm appearing on a screen. <laughs> But uh, you know what I mean. Is it, we can get too caught up in that business. Fast a little bit. Cut back on purpose. Limit your time. Find something in your life that you think, I, I, I am giving this too much attention. And fast from it. All right, so we've looked at the first two pillars of Lent, prayer and fasting. Let's turn to the third and final one, which is almsgiving. What's the connection between almsgiving and the spiritual life? I think for a lot of people, the connection is obvious when it comes to prayer and fasting. Those seem to bear obvious spiritual fruit. But how does almsgiving help our souls? Oh gosh, in so many ways, huh? Because if the heart of the spiritual life is, is caritas, right? It's love, to will the good of the other. That's a very concrete way to will the good of the other. There are poor people around us um, all the time find a way during Lent to, to give to them, to give of yourself. And I like the fact that it has to do with money. It makes it really concrete because we can get very sort of gassy and abstract about that. You know, I, I'm, I'm giving of myself. Okay, but when it comes to, to money, I'm going to give alms. I'm really going to give uh, some material value to the poor. That cuts very close to the bone, doesn't it? It, it, it's, it brings it home in a very vivid way. So I think it, it not just encourages, it is charity. It, it is the very heart of the spiritual life. See, prayer is meant to give rise to charity, ultimately. Fasting is meant to give rise to charity because it links me more deeply to God, who is caritas, who is love. So almsgiving, in some ways, that's, that's what it's all about. It also, I think, really heightens our sense of solidarity within the mystical body, that we're connected to each other. We cannot say someone who's suffering, um, that's their problem. I'm not going to worry about it. It's not my problem. No, it's our problem. It's our problem. Certainly all we who are baptized, but Aquinas speaks even of you know, the virtual mystical body, that, that everyone in principle is meant to be part of the mystical body. And so anyone, anywhere who's suffering, is brother and sister to me. And almsgiving um, signals that, you know, in a, in a very vivid way. 
I think, you know, I live out here in California where the homeless problem is very acute and it's becoming more acute all over the place. Are there poor people literally at our doorsteps now? Yeah, very often. Lent is a beautiful time, you know, to do something to um, reach out to them. Yeah, maybe offer a few more examples. I think when it comes to almsgiving, a lot of people just have in mind maybe dropping an extra envelope in the collection plate when it passes on Sunday, maybe writing a check to a charity. But what are some ways we can give alms beyond just that? And, and those aren't bad. I mean, so even those things you mentioned kind of off the top of your head, those are, those are good. But think of so many ways. Let's say um, you typically tip uh, 15% at a, a restaurant or 20%. How about in Lent, up at 5%? It's as a form of almsgiving. Tip your waiter or waitress a little more than you usually do. Um, how about during Lent? I realize this might get you on every mailing list in America, but you just make a resolution that any time during Lent some solicitation for money comes from a charity, give something. You're not going to ask any questions. You're just going to say, okay, I, I abandon myself to God's providence, and God will send me... Uh, places that need my help. Give something. Um, put a poor box in your, in your house for Lent, especially like um, you know, you've know got all your kids branded, people with big families. Uh, whenever anyone leaves the house, they have to put something in the poor box. And it could be a little bit, could be a dime, it could be a dollar, whatever. But how about for those 40 days, every time you leave the house, you're going to put something in the poor box to remind you of those in the world who are in great need. Um, um, one that I've recommended over the years, and I, boy, I challenge myself because I'm not very good at following this, but when you're buying something during Lent, whether you're buying a car, you're buying a, uh, you're buying a suit of clothes, you're buying a TV set, or you're buying you know, groceries, find the item that you really want and could afford but on purpose, buy the next level down, the one that's less expensive, and give the difference to the poor. So let's say make it, you know, we'll give a grand example. I'm buying a car, and, and here's the car I want, and, and I could afford it. All right, on purpose, get the next one down, but give the difference to the poor. Uh, there's that TV set that I really want. I want that giant TV set, and I could afford that. Buy a smaller one. Give the difference to the poor. Um, all kinds of ways. And, and be creative, you know. One thing I recommend, too, during Lent, make sure you've got uh, loose dollar bills and all that in your pocket so that when someone you see on the street uh, is, is asking for money, maybe, especially during Lent, you say, I, I'm not going to ask any questions. I'm not going to have any hesitation. I'm just going to give something. Um, just get an almsgiving mentality. In, in mind all during those 40 days. Well, it's time now for our question from one of our listeners. We love hearing from our listeners, and we'd love to hear your question. Just send it in by visiting askbishopbaron.com. You can record your question on any device. Today we have one from Sarah, who lives in Central Texas, and she's got a burning question about God's nature. Here's her question. My name is Sarah, and I'm from Central Texas. My question is, how do I respond to someone if they made the statement, if God made us in God's image, and God prefers a family to be husband, wife, and children, then it must mean that there is God represented as mother. Yeah, thanks. I mean, it's a, it's a complex, really, set of questions you're raising. Uh, can God be represented as mother? Sure, in a way, uh, the Bible uses maternal metaphors a lot for God. Um, God, you know, in, in himself, of course, is beyond gender specification. God's a spirit, so we wouldn't talk about God being gendered the way we are. And so can we use metaphors drawn from, from the feminine world? Of course, and the Bible does it all the time. So God loves us the way, you know, could a mother forget her child? Even if she forget, I will never forget you. I've carved you in the palm of my hand, um, etc. So sure, we can represent God that way. Um, what I wouldn't do is kind of overdraw the, the connection or overstate the metaphor. There is something like family, that God is like a family, because we talk about Father, Son, and Spirit. There is real differentiation among the persons. 
But I, I wouldn't overdraw it. If now we have to say, well, God's like, like father, mother, child. Um, if I could be a little bold to follow Baltazar here, in a way, the differences among the persons are greater than any differences in the created order. You know what I'm saying? That they're, they're the ground for all differentiation. So uh, are men and women different? Of course. And are the father and son and spirit different? Yeah, even, even more dramatically. But I wouldn't press the, the metaphor so we have to see within God mother, you know, father, mother, and child. Um, feminine metaphors, sure, but um, I'd stick with father, son, and spirit. Well, thanks for that question, Sarah, and thanks to all of you for watching and listening to this episode of the Word on Fire show. Again, if you haven't seen the new setup for the Word on Fire show, be sure to go to wordonfireshow.com, click on this episode, view the video version, or you can find it on YouTube and Facebook. Also, I've mentioned this over the last few episodes. I'll mention it one more time that as we're beginning Lent, I want to encourage you to encourage your parish to sign up for the Word on Fire Engage platform. We're offering it for free during Lent. You can find it at wordonfireshow.com slash engage. When your parish signs up, you get all sorts of cool tools and resources to evangelize your parish, including full access to all of Bishop Barron's films and study programs for every parishioner. That means every person in your parish can watch the Catholicism series, the Pivotal Player series, all of Bishop Barron's study programs. So if that sounds appealing, go to Word on Fire Show. Peace be with you. Friends, in the 22nd chapter of the book of the prophet Isaiah, we find the prophet's only criticism of an individual. So Isaiah often criticizes nations and peoples and indeed his own people. But the only time he singles out an individual for criticism is in chapter 22. And the person in the prophet's crosshairs is a certain Shebna. Shebna. He's described as master of the palace. Now it probably meant something like, oh, prime minister. So the palace in question is the king's palace. And Shebna is a very high official, let's say, in uh, the government. So what is it that rouses the ire of the prophet Isaiah against Shebna? So that he says, listen to this, I will thrust you from your office and pull you down from your station. Wow. What did this guy do wrong? <laughs> well, we have to look a little bit earlier in the book of the prophet Isaiah, and we find this. Thus says the Lord God of hosts, Come, Go to this steward, to this Shebna, who is master of the household, and say to him, What right do you have here? Who are your relatives here that you have cut out a tomb for yourself, cutting a tomb on the height, and carving a habitation for yourself in the rock? So, what is Isaiah complaining about? The fact that Shebna has evidently contrived to build an elaborate tomb for himself on the heights. Now, he's probably talking about the Mount of Olives. So he's in Jerusalem, in David's city. If you've been there, you know that to the east is the Mount of Olives, figures prominently throughout the Bible. Those would be the heights on which he was building this tomb, clearly not just a resting place for his body, but a kind of monument to himself. And on the heights, so that everybody will see it. He's evidently gone to enormous trouble, enormous expense, to build this uh, extraordinary monument. Think how he must have reveled in this when he was alive. <laughs> Shebna must have thought, I'm, I'm a big and important person now, but, but forever. People will remember my name. They'll see my monument. You know what comes to mind here for me is uh, Pope Julius II. Now, I don't want to totally badmouth him. He was a great figure in some ways. Without Julius II, we wouldn't have the Sistine Chapel ceiling, and we wouldn't have some of the sculptures that Michelangelo did for this elaborate tomb that Pope Julius had designed for himself or had, had uh, contrived for himself. And he wanted to place it inside of the new St. Peter's. He's also responsible for that, by the way. They, he tore down the old St. Peter's to build the one that we know. But in the very heart of it, he wanted to place this monumental tomb filled with Michelangelo sculptures as a permanent monument to himself. 
Here's the question, everybody. How are we using the power and authority that we have? Shebna has used enormous <laughs> reserves of money, energy, time, personnel in a project meant almost exclusively to aggrandize his ego. Now, one of the supreme ironies, I love this story, is Shebna wanted to be remembered forever, right? Hence, he wanted to build this tomb, which is long gone. If he is remembered, not that he's a household name, but if he is remembered by anybody, he's remembered because of this criticism in the book of the prophet Isaiah. Talk about a project backfiring. And I couldn't also help but think, most of you maybe remember this from, from high school English class, we all read that wonderful little poem, uh, Ozymandias by uh, Shelley. Remember, I'll read a little bit of it to you. I met a traveler from an antique land who said, two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them on the sand, half sunk, a shattered visage lies. So here are the, the, the crumbling remains of this great monument. And then he goes on. On the pedestal, these words appear. My name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my works, ye mighty in despair. Nothing beside remains. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. <laughs> Look at me, Ozymandias, king of kings. Here's a monument that will last forever. It's just a wreck in the sand. If anyone remembers the name, it's because of this poem that mocks him. That's very much uh, Shebna. It's Isaiah's version of Ozymandias. So because of his great flaws, the Lord removes Shebna from his position and puts in his place Hilkiah. And it says beautifully, he sets him like a peg in a firm place. And then puts on his shoulder, we hear, the key of the house of David. And they think this literally was this big device they used to open a door in the palace. So it was something you, you didn't carry in a pocket, you carried it really on your shoulder. Shebna's out. Why? Because he spent his time and money and energy and, and brought personnel to build a monument to himself. Here's the question. How do you use the power and authority that you have? Now, you know, there are people explicitly in positions of, of you know, official power, but everybody has got some kind of power. You have power in your own family. You got power in your community. You got power at your place of work. Maybe you do have some kind of the great spiritual question is, what do you do with it? It is permanently a temptation to use that power to build monuments to ourselves and to involve lots of people in that project. The point is to use our power precisely for the benefit of those whom we serve. I know that can sound a bit maybe like a, like a Boy Scout, but that's... That's the whole point of having power. That's why God gave you the power you have if you have it. It's for the sake of those that you have, have authority over. So ask yourself that question, everybody. Are you operating like Shebna? <laughs> Are you operating like Ozymandias? Are you spending a lot of your time and energy building a monument to yourself or breathing life into others? You know that it's a bit of a cliche now, but you two types of people, some that breathe life into a room, others that suck the air out of a room. And you know what I mean? Is if you're drawing everything into the sort of black hole of your own ego, you take life out of people. But the best people and, and those in authority, the best of those in authority, breathe life into people. That's our great question. Well, I think it's wonderful that the church um, couples the story of Shebna with this marvelous and familiar story from the 16th chapter of Matthew. Jesus giving the keys of the kingdom to Simon Peter. Now, I've preached on it many times before. There's so many themes we could draw out from this. But what I love is this. Just as God gives the key of David to Hilkiah, 
having set him in a firm place like a peg. Now Jesus says to Simon, you are now rocky, right? Petros in the Greek, Peter in English, you're rock. I'm setting you in a firm place and, and I'm giving you my own version of the, of the keys of the house of David. I'm giving you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. There is the authority given by Christ to his church. You know, it's wonderful, and of course, I can't help but think this as a, as a bishop of the church. Any authority I have as a bishop is derived from the successor of Peter. It's Francis, the successor of Peter, who appointed me a bishop. Any authority a priest or deacon has comes from a bishop who ordained him. The point is, all of these positions of authority, from the Pope through bishops, priests, deacons, come finally from this moment when Jesus said to Peter, I'm going to set you like a peg in a firm place. I'm going to make you a rock and I'm going to give you the keys. Has this power been abused? Yeah, sadly. Look at up and down church history. Have even popes, bishops, priests, etc., yeah, sometimes abused it. Acting more like Shebna than like Hilkiah. Building monuments to ourselves rather than breathing life into our people. So spend some time this week, everybody. Think about the kind of power you have. And first acknowledge that whatever legitimate power you have, from your family to the highest office, comes ultimately from the permission of God. It's God who's given it to you. God's allowed you to have it. But now, how do you cooperate with that grace? Be honest now. And I, it's, a, it's a point of you know, spiritual meditation for myself as well. How am I using the power I have? Building a tomb for myself up on the heights. What that will result in, trust me when I tell you this, is the mockery of Isaiah. That will result in mockery. That will result in Ozymandias. Don't waste your own precious spiritual energy and don't waste the spiritual energies of those around you building those monuments. Rather, whatever power you have, whatever keys you've been given, use them, everybody, to unlock the doors that will lead to deeper life. Use that power not to draw air out of the room, but to breathe life into it. Spend a little bit of time this week thinking about Shebna, how he's remembered. And then think about how you're using the power that God has given you. And God bless you. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed that video, I encourage you to share it and be sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel. Well, okay, good morning, everybody. Good to be with you today. And for this very holy, move it up a little bit, this very holy season of Lent that we commence. Now, you heard in the Gospel why we say there are three things we do during Lent. So the Lord talks about them. We pray, we fast, and we give alms. So for the next 40 days in preparation for Easter, we will discipline ourselves spiritually. And let me just say something simple now about each of those three moves. First of all, we pray during Lent. What's prayer? John of Damascus, many, many centuries ago, said to pray is to raise your mind and your heart to God. Beautiful, very simple definition, but good. Because, look at we spend most of our time, our minds and our hearts, focused on what? The things and people and events of this world. And there's nothing wrong with that. We live in this world. The Lord wants us to contribute to it. But at least sometime, we should very consciously raise our minds and our hearts to God. We think about God that we feel God's presence, and even more importantly, maybe, 
that we speak to God the way we speak to a friend. So think of time you spend with a friend. Maybe, especially you know, for the guys, it might not involve a lot of speech. Sometimes guys can just you know, watch a game together or something. But they're, they're expressing their friendship that way. Speak to God, just spend time with God. That's prayer. Okay, to make it a little more concrete, what we're doing right now, the Catholic Church says, is the source and summit of the Christian life. This is the highest form of prayer there is. So, Catholics, if you've been staying away from Mass on Sunday, here is a great time, Lens, to come back. The best way to pray is to come to Mass. Now, maybe if you, you come to Mass with your family every Sunday, how about during Lent, come to daily Mass? I remember many years ago, I was just younger than you guys, and my mother had this tradition of, of going to Mass during Lent every day. And one year, I think I was like, I don't know, 11 or 12 years old, she challenged me and said, do you, you want to come with me? And, and I did that one year. And honest to God, it, it changed me at some level. I went to Mass every day during Lent. It was like, kind of like a challenge. Some days I didn't feel like it. It was kind of a lot to go every day, but I did. And it really made a difference in my life. Something else you can do to pray. I don't know if you guys, some of you pray the rosary. Do you know about the rosary prayer? Maybe your parents or your grandparents pray it. If you can find a rosary in your house, get it. If you don't know how to pray it, go online. There's all kinds of places that teach you how to pray the rosary. The rosary is a great prayer. It's a very peaceful, contemplative prayer. Do it. Here's another one. It's called the Jesus Prayer. Very prominent, by the way, in Eastern Christianity. The Jesus Prayer is this. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. That's the whole prayer. But what you do is you pray it over and over and over again. Just keep repeating it. For a minute, for five minutes, for a half hour, or if you're one of the really serious monks in the eastern part of the, of the Christian world, all day. So it becomes like part of your breathing. Lord Jesus Christ. And they say when you say that part of it, breathe in. And then have mercy on me, a sinner. <sighs> breathe out as though you're breathing out your, your sins. The Jesus prayer can be a great way to kind of ground yourself again in prayer. But here's the last one I'm going to suggest to you. What's called the examination of conscience. Here's how it works. It's very simple. At the end of your day, so let's say you're, you're in bed, you're getting ready to go to sleep. Just replay your day a bit like playing a movie in your mind. Just go over your day. People you met, things that happened to you. Thank God for all the good things. So I would hope that maybe tonight, before you go to bed, you, you thank God for this Mass, this chance to be together with all your friends and to celebrate the Lord's presence. At the same time, you ask God forgiveness for the times you were less than loving in that day. Maybe there was a missed opportunity. Maybe someone, you know, crossed your path and you were kind of cruel to them or you, were, you ignored them. And then say, Lord, I, I'm sorry for that. At the end of the day, do the examination of conscience. Could I challenge everybody? How about during Lent, during these 40 days, every night, takes, it might take you, what, three minutes, five minutes. Examine your conscience. Okay, prayer. Next thing we do during Lent, we fast. It's probably what's best known about Lent, right? That we fast from certain things. Mind you, Catholics have nothing against the pleasures of the body. Of food and drink and sex. We're, we're not Puritans. We celebrate those things. God gave us our bodies, and the pleasures of the body are a good thing. What's the problem, though? The problem is when those desires become so central that they dominate us. I don't know if you know this name. Thomas Merton was a great spiritual writer of the last century. Merton said, our bodily desires, like for, for food and for drink, are like little kids. So think of, of parents of little tiny kids who want what they want when they want it, right? 
Mom, give me, Dad, I want, I want, give, give me the ice cream, I want it now, now. Well, you can't indulge the kids and give them whatever they want when they want it, right? It's not good for them, it's not good for you. So, Merton said, our bodily desires can be like that. They want what they want immediately, and we have to discipline them. Now listen, why, why? So that the deeper hungers of your life might emerge. I'm talking here about the hunger for meaning, the hunger for purpose, the hunger for real value, the hunger for friendship, the hunger for justice, and yes, ultimately, the hunger for God. And it, it might be difficult at your stage of life to sense this, but every one of us has deep down this hunger and longing for God. And see, if we're dominated by our, by our bodily desires all the time, we never let that deeper hunger emerge. So, so during Lent, we fast. Now, maybe find something that you think has become too important to you. It's maybe some kind of food, some kind of drink, smoking, or I don't know what it is. But something where you say, you know, that has become too dominant in my life. So I'm going to fast from that. Good. Nothing wrong with that. But can I make another type of suggestion? Also, everybody, can we fast from certain sins that bedevil us? Let me make a suggestion. Because I, I know it's true here, because it's true in every human community. I'm talking about the sin of gossip. Listen to the Pope sometimes. Pope Francis is always going on about the danger of gossip. What's gossip? Look, we all do it, right? We're all sinners in this room. Gossip is talking negatively about someone to another person who can do nothing to help the situation. Now, you see the point I'm making is if something's going wrong, there's a legitimate complaint and you bring it to people who have the responsibility and the power to do something constructive about it. So let's say there's something that's bugging you in this, in this school, and you go to your principal, and you, you bring this issue up. That's not gossip. Gossip is going to your friend who can do nothing about it. Then all you're doing is spreading negativity around you. And then, of course, your friend picks up on this, and then she'll spread it to someone else negatively. And before you know it, there's poison all over the place. Am I right, fellow sinners? I mean, any human community I know of, schools, families, parishes, cities, there's this problem of gossip. Can I suggest to you, how about a great thing to fast from for the next 40 days? Gossip. Here's a concrete suggestion. When you feel the urge, you're with some friends, and you want to say something negative about somebody, stop yourself and say something positive instead. Try it. <laughs> it ain't easy. But try it during Lent. Say, for the next 40 days, when I feel the temptation, to, did, did you hear about what she did? Did you? Did you? Stop yourself and say something positive. Okay? So we pray during Lent, we fast during Lent. Third thing, we give alms during Lent. That means we give of our substance to help those who are poor. I remember years ago, uh, I was a professor at the seminary in Chicago. And we had students from all over the world there, including from Africa. There was a young guy that came from Uganda. He had never left Uganda and he was now in Chicago, this foreign country. He was from a very simple village in Uganda. And so he arrived at the seminary, and we had to get him some things. And so we brought him to the local grocery store. Like, we don't have Gelson's in Chicago, but like Gelson's, like the local grocery store, right? That to us was just like, yeah, it's the grocery store. We walked in with this young guy, and he saw aisle after aisle after aisle, a stocked with food and supplies. You know what he said to me? He said, 
Oh, th this must be the like the regional food center for the whole state. And I said, no, I mean, there's actually another one just like it, you know, a few miles away. My point here is, look, we all know this. We are among the most privileged and wealthy people in the world. If you look at the whole world, we're right near the top, everybody in this room. We've been given enormous privileges and benefits. But we're also, everybody, we're members of what the church calls the mystical body of Christ. That means we are connected to every other baptized person in the world. And it's not like we're just members of a, of a club or a community. No, no. Mystical body. We're like cells and molecules and organs in the same organism. Does that make sense? That's the church. That's the church. Therefore, we who are specially privileged have an obligation to care for those who are not. Now, I know you guys, I mean, high school students wouldn't have a lot of disposable income, but this mentality of almsgiving, that should fill your minds and fill your hearts. Here's a couple of simple suggestions. Do we always have to have the, the best clothes or cars or, or you know, uh, electronic equipment or the iPhone or whatever? How about settle sometimes for the one that's not quite at the top of the heap? And then give that difference to the poor. Oh, there's that shirt or there's that dress or there's that, that, that whatever it is I want to buy. Do you have to buy the, the best, most expensive one? Could you buy the next level down and then give that difference to the poor? How about keep a poor box in your house during Lent? Here's how it works. Put a little box by the door of your house. And for the next 40 days, every time you leave the house, put something in it for the poor. And I don't know, a quarter, a dollar, five dollars, I don't know what it is. But all during Lent, put something every day when you leave the house in the poor box. Be aware that there are a lot of people around us who are a lot less privileged than we are. And be willing to give alms, especially during Lent. Okay? So, three things. I just want to kind of burn these into your, into your minds and your hearts. Three things. For the next 40 days, pray. Raise your mind and heart to God. Fast. And may I suggest, especially from gossip, give alms. Be mindful of the poor. Now, I'm going to mark you and the other ministers, too, with these ashes. It's one of those beautiful symbols in the life of the church. It's a reminder of our mortality, right? I'm going to say to you as you receive them, remember you are dust, and unto dust you shall return. But it's also a way of saying, I'm a Catholic. And I want the whole world to know. And that's it. you might feel kind of funny. I got this goofy, you know, ash-shaped or cross-shaped ash on my forehead. But that's the idea, is you're telling the whole world, here's who I am, and here's what I'm dedicated to do for the next 40 days. Pray, 